Hello, listener. We left off part one of this epic chat with Brooke, hearing all about how to reduce the unnecessary laboriousness, if that's a word, of decision making and prioritization, why it's okay to figure it all out as you go, and what we take into business from our other roles. But this part two is heavily focused on money, one of my favorite things to talk about. And you're going to hear how to reframe selling what you do to a client for the benefit of your bank balance and your longevity, how to not overcomplicate making money, reframing the old Australian tall poppy syndrome. My international friends, I would love to hear your thoughts on this seemingly very Australian roadblock for many people in business and the radical potential you have within this path of self-employment. So let's get straight into the chat. We've talked a little bit about money and, and the relationship to it, but I'm interested as a service provider because it's so much easier as a product-based business to price, right? Like we get to take that whole other thing out of it. It's just like product market fit, prestige pricing or no, you know, all of those things are like questions to be answered, right? But when it comes to pricing ourselves in things like workshops, coaching one-on-one or courses or speaking or anything, it's a whole other game. What was that experience like for you and, and what have been some of the challenges you've worked through? So 16 years ago, I would have given you a completely different answer. And I think most people do that by thinking it's very, very personal. And, you know, we were talking briefly about energy vampires. I got myself into a load of different conversations with people where they would be deliberately manipulating me and trying to get me to either work for free or work for very little. And I think in that situation, if you show a sense of vulnerability, then you will be exploited for that, which, you know, seems like a horrible thing to say, but, you know, I'm not here to make friends. I'm here to save you time, effort and money, hopefully. So what has changed from then to now is that I have made it way less personal. I'm not selling myself. I'm not even selling my hours, yeah? I am selling services, I'm selling courses, I'm selling masterminds, I'm selling programs, masterclasses, and therefore there's a separation between Brooke McCarthy, myself, the person, and my work. That is like step number one. Step number two is that you're communicating value. That is our responsibility as business owners. We assume a lot. Most business owners assume a lot on behalf of our market. We assume people know what we do. We assume they know how we do it. We assume that they understand how the impact of our work will change their life. And they don't. That is our responsibility. And so we can qualify and quantify value. There are ways and means to do this. And we qualify and quantify value because people don't understand value. All they see is the price. They see the price tag and they make a decision, is this reasonable air quotes or unreasonable air quotes. The third thing I think, and again, this hopefully will piss a few people off, your price is arbitrary. You get to decide. There are probably people out there, I know there are people out there selling pricing formulas and maybe if you're selling products, well, probably if you're selling products, that 100% makes sense. But if you are selling services and especially if you're selling courses or coaching or programs or masterminds or memberships, your price is arbitrary. There are people selling memberships right now for $7 a month that appear, from my perspective, to be packed with value. And yet I can still sell, you know, something which is several thousand dollars a month and people buy it. So I think that we make a huge big deal about pricing and we make it mean something. We make it personal. We tell stories about it that actually aren't in our best interests, yeah? And then the stories that we've created then make us jealous, annoyed, pissed off, angry, resentful, and the rest, and, you know, keep us poor. (laughs) So, you know, I really think that people tend to overcomplicate pricing and overcomplicate making money. And, you know, one of the most creative, fun things that I do is I, I, I have a great idea in the shower in the morning I write a sales page or create a short sales page. I duplicate a sales page and then edit a sales page and then I sell it in the afternoon. And it doesn't need to be complicated. You know, it doesn't need to have all of these bells and whistles. And I think oftentimes when we don't understand something, we tend to overcomplicate it. 
And we tend to be vulnerable, again, you know, to the manipulative marketing messages from people that make it sound really, you know, complicated. So quick story to illustrate my point. I've got a friend who's a photographer. She had been an assistant. She told me this story about 10 years ago. I never forgot it. She was an assistant for a photographer who charged a lot, who was well regarded, you know, kind of like a semi-famous photographer. And the client was watching the photo shoot. So my friend is taking direction from the famous photographer and he's making all these complicated instructions, do this, do, you know, but it's really, she could, she's scratching her head going, what the hell does he want me to do? And then she realized it's because the client is watching that the famous photographer is making the instructions sound really complicated rather than just saying, pick up that light, move it over there, pick up that light, move it over there. And that's oftentimes what people do when they're trying to make something sound, you know, bigger than it is. I sound like a very cynical marketer, but I think that's one of the reasons why I'm good at it because I am cynical. If it gives you any comfort at all, um, it doesn't sound like a cynical marketer at all to me. And I think it's very healthy, very, very healthy conversation to be. And I, I want to delve into two areas of what you said, because I'm so intrigued in them. But first of all, I just love the point that you made about price being arbitrary, because there is one woman in particular, I've taken huge, huge inspiration of as it starts to change my fundamental relationship with money, uh, which, you know, I think we all have that we all either have a scarcity complex of money, or we have, I've got a worker mentality of money, which is like, I have yeah. to work hard to get it. And I've been working on that, because you know, there's, there's, there are those foundational elements that get in the way of the stuff that we know. There's this incredible woman. She's, I think it's product positioning in particular is, is her speciality. But it's she's so clear on her value in that space. And yes, she is selling on, you know, big roles that she's taken before with major companies in this space. But if you go to her website, you will see that you can hire her for a day for sixty-five thousand dollars. I'm not fucking around. Sixty-five and three zeros. <laughs> and I looked at that and I was like, Okay, that's goals. That's what I'm talking mm. about. That is mm. absolute confidence in your skill set uh, that you can go to yep. market and say, I will do this thing for you and it will be hugely valuable for you. And it was going to equate to X number of increased sales potentially across your business if you take some of these on board, you know, making sure that it's clear in terms of the money spent versus the uptick. And it's just gone yeah. out there with that price. And I just, I love it. That's my inspiration because Lord knows I don't want to be in a conversation when someone's talking down my hourly rate like that. I'm not here for that. No, it's you know all about value. So I, I love that you highlight that point. I loved what you said about your shower thoughts. First of all, I only just discovered that this product exists, but you must get one of those little shower thoughts writing things. Um, just to oh, on the yes, <laughs> yes. If that person is listening and they made that product, please get in touch with me so that I can put you on this podcast because I love that idea. So, uh, you talked about you know having a shower thought, creating a sales page and selling it. And I want to just get into that little bit with the selling. So going to market with it, what do you find is your most effective approach for the audience that you've built? Like where do you where do you sell it? How do you do it? Yeah, so hands down email. Uh, January 2010, I decided I was going to send at least one mass email a month every month forever after and that's what I've done uh, and that was probably one of the smartest and easiest decisions I've ever made. So email number one. Number two would probably be live video. This is something that I'm exploring more and more because I think that there's a lot of value in seeing people speak about what they're selling in a very, you know, again, the word confident, in a very confident way and to get a sense of who they are. And I think podcasting is also would probably be number three. To tell you the truth, I prefer podcasting to video because it's just your voice and your ideas right? Whereas if it's video, people are like, you know, I'm looking at myself thinking I look a bit flushed and why does my hair always look so limp? And, you know, <laughs> it's easy to look at a, you know, a video of somebody and go, Jesus, that's a terrible shirt. What was she thinking? So, you know, stuff that's not actually important. Whereas when we're listening to a voice on the podcast, we're just getting the ideas and we're just getting all the good stuff without all the superficial stuff that humans are so great at. So that would be like the top places and I think that you know we were talking before about how do you how do you make money quickly like how do you if, if there's an economic downturn for example you know how do you kind of make money quickly I think that the ultimate experiment and validation is do people buy the thing 
I see a lot of business owners, not a lot, but I see a good segment of business owners who are dedicating a PhD to the topic of market research when they could just save themselves a shit ton of time, effort and money and jump straight into validating with a paid thing. So the ultimate validation is is somebody willing to put their hand in their pocket and pay for this thing? They are, great. Now I just need to sell it again, sell it again, sell it again, refine it, edit, iterate, maybe elevate, change the pricing, change the positioning, change the branding, et cetera, et cetera. The other thing that you said about the $65,000 a day rate is I think we need to, you know, in so far as making more money, one of the fundamental things is we need to get away from this, especially as service providers. We have got to divorce our hours from our earnings. And it makes no sense that we are still charging by the hour. It is a leftover of the industrial revolution. I know clients will ask for your hourly rate. I still get clients, you know, new clients, not people that know me, that, you know, want to press me on what my hourly rate is. And it's like, it is so irrelevant what my hourly rate is because I can give you the best idea in two and a half minutes. You know, I could edit a sales page in an hour and it will take, you know, somebody else with similar skills to, you know, a week or three to do the same thing. So the fact that you are being penalised when you're fast and that you're being penalised when you're highly experienced or insightful is ridiculous. And so I kind of saw this play out very early on. I was charging $60 an hour initially and my very first client, I still had two or three years later. I'd put my price up multiple times by then. He said, oh, Brooke, you're the most expensive person on my team. I was, you know, a contractor. He said, there's a young guy who's just started working with me and he's so enthusiastic. He spends, you know, lots of hours educating himself on YouTube and I pay him $20 an hour. And I'm listening to this thinking, none of this makes sense. You're paying this guy 20 bucks an hour on your time to educate himself and you resent paying me $60 an hour to do it in a fraction of the time and to do it better. Like make that make sense to me. Yeah. So, I mean, we need to get away from that. One of the things that I do is I help clients to realize what their IP and their assets are in business and to leverage those. And we all have assets and IP, even when we don't think we do, you know, so for example, in training and coaching, that is a presentation, that is a PowerPoint or a Canva presentation. That's one of the things that you can do, you know, to kind of start to divorce your hours from your earnings. I really like that thinking because, yeah, the more we produce as well, we get to see that. Oh, look at that. That's a great thing. I've got that now. That's something that's worth, that's valuable. I can see that outside of myself and it starts to Mm. shift that away from the hours in the day. So where do you want to see your business grow to then over the coming months and years? I think that self-employment is actually quite radical. I know it's in fashion. I know that it is increasingly popular and that more and more people are starting businesses, which is great. You know, I had a journalist call me from the New Daily in the middle of 2020 and say, hey, do you think COVID is a good time to start a business? I'm like, oh my God, I was born to answer this question. Let me tell you. So, you know, I think it is still quite radical because what you are in effect doing and what my family has done is we have stepped outside of the norm. Yes, we live in suburbia. Yes, it's not that exotic, you know, in the North Shore of Sydney. (laughs) But, you know, we are in effect able to kind of create our own wealth. We can take our children overseas, which we have done for extended periods of time, and we can live and work overseas. We can redistribute that wealth in other ways. I would rather give to charity than pay tax. So as much as possible, I'm trying to maximize, you know, my tax deductible donations and minimize my tax And it has the potential to make massive inroads into many of the massive social problems in Australia. So I'm talking about things like domestic violence, like youth suicide, like the brain drain from country towns and regional remote communities into big cities. There are so many major social issues in Australia and confidence. Like I think as a nation, Australians generally have pretty low confidence. I I don't have any global research to back that up. But that is my feeling that, you know, a lot of our macho, bravado, masculine, just crap, bad behavior is actually a sign of low self-confidence and not really having a good firm grip on our identity as a nation. 
And I think all of these issues and more could be solved if we had more of a democratic access to self-employment skills, not just the money-making skills, not just the technical skills, but the soft skills that we've spent so much time talking about today, Kim, like the resilience, the resourcefulness, the adaptability, the creativity, you know, the, you know, you can make something out of nothing that entrepreneurs are so good at. I would love to be able to deliver business, you know, how to start a business and how to grow a business and how to market a business in a much bigger, broader national sense. And I am already doing that through, you know, New South Wales Business Connect program. But, you know, I think that it could be done far more effectively and far more efficiently and to very deliberately bring it into communities that don't have ready access to it. Because let's let's be honest, big cities and, and towns, you know, we are spoilt for choice with business advice and business, you know, resources. There is plenty going on. This is not where it's needed. It's needed in, you know, marginalized groups or marginalized identities where actually it could make a massive impact. Imagine if you had a woman in a abusive relationship where she didn't feel that she could leave because she didn't have the finances and all of a sudden she had a side business she was you know saving money she was squirreling money away and now she has choice now she has options that she didn't have before so you know this is just one small example of how i actually you know think it's quite a radical thing to be self employed and i think the potential for it is enormous and goes far beyond opening a bricks and mortar business with traditional business model, you know, and selling donuts like, uh, you know, Scott Morrison loves to highlight or love to highlight. (laughs) Yuck, a very quick quick way to make me feel nauseous is to mention that name. Uh, So, (laughs) yes, I I, um, absolutely hear what you're saying, that, um, that confidence issue. I always think that tall poppy syndrome, like what is that hiding? You know, why do we do that to each other, to bring each other down? Like what, what is driving that behavior? So often we bring others down because of a reflection of what we don't see in ourselves. And so I can absolutely get on board with that. We've got a confidence issue through we and do. through and we will continue to rebuild ourselves as individuals um, and hopefully positively influence those around us to do the same. On that note, how can we support you? So me and the listener who is tuning into this conversation now, how can we support you to grow your business? Because you've given us so much to help us grow ours. (laughs) Well, if you're listening to this on a podcast app, you could hop into the search and look for Meaningful Work, Remarkable Life, which is my podcast. I've got lots and lots of free resources. And, you know, I really think that free resources are a great way to try before you buy. I think they're a necessary way you know, to try before you buy and to get a sense of somebody's style and if they know what they're talking about. Because if you're selling services, you're selling promises. So you need to give your knowledge away in order for people to know that you've got it in the first place. So probably my minimum viable marketing plan would be a good place to start. That's a free resource. You can find it on hustleandheart.com.au. Instagram is probably my favorite Uh, even though they make marketing very difficult. You can find me on Instagram at Brooke McCarthy and there's no E on Brooke and I will love you forever if you remember that. I'm on all the major social media channels pretty much as Brooke McCarthy. Don't look me up on TikTok, a little embarrassing. Um, But yeah, all the usual places. Brilliant. I'll make it nice and easy for the listener and have all the links to everything we just mentioned then in the show notes so that they're nice, clickable and easy to follow along. Brooke, it has been such a pleasure to connect with you. I know we've been meaning to do this for a little while and all good things come at the right time. And let me tell you, it's been the right time for me today to hear some of this messaging. So thank you for being on the show and sharing so much with me and with the listener. Thanks, Kim. It's been a pleasure. I've enjoyed it very much. Thank you for listening to Unemployed and Afraid, the podcast for small business builders with your host, me, Kim Curtin. If you love it, you can say thanks with a star rating and a review. And of course, join the community on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Find us at Unemployed and Afraid wherever you're hanging out, and I'll see you there.